Hebrews 9.1. Now, the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place. It had the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered with gold on all sides, in which was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above the Ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. With these things prepared like this, the priests enter the first room repeatedly, performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room. And he does that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was standing. This is a symbol for the present time, during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations that only deal with food, drink, and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who, suffer, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we can serve the living God? This is the word of the Lord. As we begin, I think about an interesting trend. I wonder if you, you noticed this. Back in the, about the mid-2010s, there was this trend happening online as companies, particularly news companies, that were shifting from, away from print media and into digital media. And they began to add paywalls to the websites to increase their revenues because their revenues had been dropping as paid print subscriptions were going down and ad revenues were going down as a result of that and people were installing ad blockers and so companies had to get savvy and think about ways that they could increase their revenues. So they began restricting access to content. You've probably come across this. Now you have to pay for it. So like, I was, you know, I was growing up when the internet was coming into being and, I, and for so long st- information and content was just free, right? And you kind of get used to that. So now like when I click on a New York Times article that interests me, and they're like, nope, you've already read your num- max number of articles. So like, you got to pay. And I'm like, well, it's an interesting article, but I'm not that interested in reading it. So I just <laughs> move on. But I, I get that companies, they need to make money, right? They deserve to make money off the content that they're producing. But I think because I was used to the free stuff for so long, I just, I still feel entitled to access. Like, I'm sort of offended by the paywall. Like, what? But the paywall is there for a reason, right? And, and, and when it's there, it reminds me, no, don't take free access and full access for granted. It's actually restricted. I see a parallel here as I think about Hebrews 9 and how I used to view God personally. Before I was a Christian, I assumed that I should have full and free access to God. And I think a lot of people probably feel, access, feel entitled to access to him. Like that God should hear their prayers, that God should answer them, that God should bless them, and that when they die, God should welcome them into his presence in heaven. That's a very common assumption, a, a sense of entitlement. I don't know where that comes from, but it was in me, and I see that in a lot of people as well. And I don't think that I had considered that my sin had actually erected a barrier between God and me that prevented access, my, my sin and the holy God. I hadn't considered this wall that was there. But as the Holy Spirit was drawing me to Christ, he was making my conscience more aware of my sin, and I began to be more troubled by my sin. Now, I can look back, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have used these words back then, but now I look back and I go, I was running from God. I was hiding from God. So I had this sort of paradoxical, like I should have access to God. And yet at the same time, I knew there was a wall there. I knew that I was defiled by my sin. I didn't have language for that. I do now from the scripture. But I began to sense that there was this wall separating me from God. And I had assumed full and free access. But then I hit this sort of like a wall, like a paywall that says restricted. And I didn't have a means to get in. I didn't have what it took to pay to get in there. I couldn't clear my guilty conscience. I couldn't get away from this ongoing, growing sense of my condemnation before God. And I wanted to get past the wall, and I didn't know how to do that. I didn't even know that I wanted to. I just 
Now looking back, I can see these things more clearly. But praise God, he's merciful. And there were Christians in my life who were sharing with me the good news of Jesus, the gospel. And they shared with me that, yes, there is, it's true that access to God has been denied because there is a wall. It's our sin. But here's the good news that Jesus' death paid the price for our sin so that we could have full access to God and a clear conscience through the forgiveness of all of our sins. So I want to ask you, have you ever felt like there's a wall between you and God? Have you ever felt like that there's a separation that's there? Has your conscience testified to you that your sin is in the way? If so, then the same good news that I heard is the good news that I want to talk about with you this morning from this text. And this is the point that the author of Hebrews is making in our passage. What God has done through Jesus Christ and the new covenant. And here it is in a nutshell. In the new covenant, we have full access to God and complete cleansing from sin. In Christ, in the new covenant, for those who are in Christ, we have full access now to God and complete cleansing from sin. So what the author of Hebrews does in this section is he's going to compare and contrast the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, with the new covenant in Christ. And he's going to demonstrate the superiority of the new covenant above the old covenant as he highlights some limitations that were in some inherent inadequacies, if you will, in the old covenant. We talked about that last week when Darren was preaching. The the issue wasn't so much in the old covenant itself and what God had laid out. The problem was with the people. But, But as a result, there's this inadequacy. For what we truly need, there's this inadequacy in the old covenant. And so in the first 10 verses, he highlights what I'm just gonna point out is two central limitations of the old covenant. So we wanna look at those. And first of all, under the old covenant, there was, first of all, restricted access to God. That was one of its major limitations. There was restricted access to God. So as the author begins this section, he begins with a description of the tabernacle, which was this mobile uh, tent in the wilderness, this, this, this like, earthly sanctuary, he calls it in verse 1. Eventually, that becomes the temple when Solomon builds the temple. It has the same sort of order and, and regulations. So the author focuses on two of the rooms inside The tabernacle, verse 2 tells us, look there, in the first room, which is called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. And verse 3 tells us, behind the second curtain, which really is this this room, was a tent, a room really, called the most holy place. So you had the holy place, and you had the most holy place. They were separated by a thick embroidered curtain. And the most holy place, literally there, is holy of holies. That's, That's the literal terminology there which represented the very presence of God with his people. And the room, then the author talks about these rooms were furnished with different items from Israel's history. Look at verses four and five. It had the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides, in which was the gold jar containing the manna, so the bread in the wilderness, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the tablets of the covenant, the cherubim of glory, the the angels, the, the carved angels, they, they, they were above the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. The mercy seat is where the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifices, and that was called the place of atonement, or propitiation, where, where the wrath of God was, and the justice of God was satisfied by, by the sacrifices that had been made. And he says, it is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now, which is kind of funny to me. He knows he's limited in time and space, kind of like, did he have a countdown clock like I have? I, 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 I feel the pressure there. I, I want to talk about all these things that are there too, but I, but I don't have the time. He doesn't go into detail because he would have known that his Jewish readers already know all these things. So they're f- deeply, they, they're familiar with these things. They're acquainted with these things. And it seems to me he has a profound appreciation of these things. So even though he's going to demonstrate the, the limited nature of the old covenant, he doesn't disparage it. He speaks with profound appreciation for the tabernacle. But even so, he highlights the inadequacy of the old covenant. Access was limited to God. Limited. Access to God was limited. So if you think about the worshipers, outside in the courtyard, there was, there was a basin for, for washing your hands, and there was an altar where the priest would offer sacrifices. But that's as far as y- your average worshiper could go. Only the priests could go inside. So you could never, if you were an Old Testament Israelite, you would never be able to go into the tabernacle. Only the priests could go in there, into the holy place where they did their ministry. Verse 6 says, with these things, prepa- with these things prepared like this, the priests enter the first room, repeatedly performing their ministry. So they did their ministry there like repeatedly over and over. That's where they did their ministry. But even they as priests weren't permitted to enter the most holy place. So think about it. There's this restriction. There's these layers of access to God. If you think you're just the average Israelite, you're not allowed to go inside. The only people that are allowed to go inside are the priests and you had to be of the tribe of Levi. So if you're not of the tribe of Levi, you're out. Nothing personal against you. You're just not descended from the Levites. So then if you're a priest, 
then you can go in. And even if you're a priest, you're not allowed to go into the next space. Only the high priest. And that once a year. Look at verse 7. But the high priest alone enters the second room. This is the most holy place. And he does that only once a year, never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. So yes, was God is there truly among his people, but in a qualified way. There were restrictions. And it was only once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest entered the most holy place and sprinkled the blood of the sacrifices to make atonement for the, his sins and for the sins of the people. Now, we should ask, why is the author, if he's speaking to Jewish Christians and who know all these things about the tabernacle, why is he, I mean, he even says he's not going into detail, but he's listing everything out. Why is he going to such great lengths to talk about all these things inside um, the tabernacle? All of this stuff about the Jewish worship under the old covenant. His readers already know all this stuff. Well, the reason for his recounting of all these things becomes more clear to us in verse 8. So look there. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. So his point is that during the entire old covenant era with the tabernacle and temple worship, there was no direct access to God. That thick embroidered curtain that hung between the two rooms, between the holy place and the most holy place, that symbolized the fact that the way into the very presence of God had not yet been opened for everyone. It, yet, it wasn't open yet. That's what that symbolized. So God built into the tabernacle an illustration, a lesson. There is no direct access to God, at least not yet. And so the, the worship in the tabernacle, it also represents a second limitation in the Old Covenant. So here's the second limitation, namely that under the Old Covenant, there was only partial cleansing from sin. There was only partial cleansing from sin. Look at verse 9. This is a symbol For the present time, during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect. That word perfect means to cleanse or to clear the worshiper's conscience. So think about the tabernacle and all its regulations. God had built in this symbolism, which he's revealing to us through the author of Hebrews, symbolizing the inadequacy of the old covenant to ultimately and finally deal with our sin and our troubled consciences. You see that? That there's already inherent, and God is the one who architected, he's the one who gave the instructions to the tabernacle for Moses, and Moses builds it all, but we don't know what all of those things mean until we're given the divine interpretation of what the things mean and what they symbolize. It's built in as the symbolism that this is actually inadequate. It's not the final say. It's not the final thing that God is doing. It is not able to deal fully and finally with your sin <clears throat> and with your impure consciences. It could never perfect it. It could never purify, cleanse, or clear the worshiper's conscience. Now, what is your conscience? It's your moral consciousness. It's your God-given awareness testifying that you have done either right or wrong. Now, you can read about that in Romans 2, that that's part of God's general revelation to the world. God can make himself known that he exists through creation and through conscience. This moral law that seems to exist inside us that that testifies to whether or not we have done right or we have done wrong. It's our moral consciousness. So then we should ask this question. Why couldn't worship under the old covenant completely clear away the feelings of condemnation that the worshipers felt inside them? Why couldn't it? God has a whole bunch of prescriptions and regulations. Wouldn't God do something? Wouldn't that be enough to take care of the condemnation that people felt inside them? Why were their consciences still troubled? Well, part of the answer, at least is found in verse 7, which I skipped over a phrase there because I knew I wanted to come back to it here. Remember in verse 7, it says, for the high priest offers the blood of sacrifices. It says, for himself and for the sins the people had, notice this phrase, committed in ignorance. The Old Testament law, and I don't know that I really thought about this much before this week, which is why Bible study is good because you're just always learning and and seeing things, but I hadn't reflected much on this before though I knew that that this exists that I hadn't reflected on, the Old Testament law made provision for the forgiveness of unintentional sins. Sins that were committed on accident or unknowingly or not in a premeditated way. You can go to the book of Old Testament book of Numbers chapter 15 to read more about that. So there was no provision actually in the Old Testament law. There was no sacrifice that you could do for the forgiveness of premeditated sins or what Numbers 15 calls the sin of the high hand, a sin that is committed against God in total outright defiance against him in a sort of a premeditated way, deliberate defiance against God. 
And so in Judaism, there, understandably, there was intense debate over what qualified as an unintentional sin. So you can see why an Old Testament worshiper under the Old Covenant would not have a completely clear conscience in worship. Because how could you be assured of forgiveness when in all likelihood you had probably committed some deliberate sins along the way? That they probably weren't all unintentional. But you don't know. You, you don't have a divine list of those things. So you're there before God hoping that God's going to forgive you. And some commentators actually think that when David sinned with Bathsheba and his murder against Uriah, I mean, if there's any premeditated sin that's recorded in the Bible, it's that. And so in Psalm 51, when he's saying, you will not accept sacrifice, O Lord, he basically just throws himself at God's mercy because he knows I can't just offer some sacrifices and think that my outright defiant premeditated sin of the high hand here is going to be forgiven because your word tells me there's no provision there. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but it makes sense to me that David's saying, I need mercy. There's no provision for sacrifice here. So his conscience was on him. Now the conscience is a God-given capacity that we should not ignore. And it's why people, because we have conscience, it's why people of every place, in every culture, no matter where you are in the world, experience feelings of moral guilt. Now that can be explained naturalistically as a, as a the result of naturalistic evolution, or it can be just explained how it is biblically. That God is actually a divine lawgiver that he has put his image in us. And part of that image is understanding that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And so people have different explanations and they have different ways of trying to deal with those guilt feelings, whether it's suppression or some other means to, to, to rid themselves because nobody wants those feelings of guilt. Nobody wants those feelings of condemnation. That's why we rationalize things. That's why we justify things. That's why we suppress things. So, I mean, think about even people here in the United States who would consider themselves secular. Maybe you consider yourself secular or an irreligious person. There are folks in that category that may try to prove to themselves that they're good by what they do because it helps them to feel righteous and it helps them put away that feeling that I'm wrong, I've done something wrong or I'm not righteous. Things like getting involved in social activism, which is not always bad, but it is if you use that as a means to make, your own, make yourself righteous and they can make themselves, uh, make, let people know so that they make sure that people know that they're on the so-called right side of the issue. You know, social media has become a platform for people all across the political and social spectrum to trumpet their righteousness and to hide their sinfulness. Is that not true? Do we not present the best sides of ourselves? Do we not want to convince others of our righteousness and our rightness, that we are on the right side of history, that we are on the right side of the issue? Listen, if you can play up your righteousness and downplay your sinfulness, you're going to feel better about yourself. And that's one way to deal with your wrongness, your sin before God. Just go ahead and just suppress the accusation of your conscience, conscience that tells you that you are actually morally guilty. In other religions, there's ways of dealing with guilt. You can't get outside the fact that people experience guilt and they know there is sin in them. But they look to other ways and other means to, to clear themselves. Did you know that every year, Millions of Hindus travel to the Ganges River. They believe the waters are holy and that they will bathe in the river and rinse themselves, believing that its waters will wash away their sins. They're looking for absolution. They're looking for redemption. So here's a picture. There's millions every year will go into this river, believing that the goddess Ganga, who is the, the Hindu goddess of purification and forgiveness, will forgive them. Now, there's a true story of a Christian missionary who approached a young woman who was wailing in grief among the throngs there at the river's edge. And when he asked her what's wrong, she said, the problems in my home are too many and my sins are heavy on my heart. So I offered the best I have to the goddess Ganga, my firstborn son. So here's a woman trying desperately to cleanse herself of her sins. She knows she has them. She's got to get rid of them. So she believes the, God, the Hindu goddess Ganga, the goddess of purification and forgiveness, is the way to do that. So much so that she'd offer her own child in sacrifice. Offering sacrifice because she wants forgiveness of sins. What about, what about Christians, those who identify as Christians who have troubled consciousness, consciences? We have a prescribed way in scripture to deal with that deep sense that we're wrong when our conscience testifies against us. We have a scriptural prescription confession, and repentance, right? But so often, when we sin, 
and our consciences are defiled. Don't we often run away from God instead of running to God for mercy because we're ashamed? So we run away and we hide from him and we hide away from his community. As a pastor, the people I know who get trapped in sin, there's always a pattern. It's like they cut themselves off from God, but that can be sort of abstract. So you know who else they cut themselves off from? The community of Christ. Because that's where sin thrives in the secrecy and in the darkness. When the very thing that needs to happen is to bring yourself into the light, to run to God for mercy, not away from God in hiding and in shame. But that's what we do sometimes because we're trying to figure out our own system for putting away those feelings of moral guilt. God has prescribed a way. But sometimes instead what we do is we just try to be better people. We just sort of try to be the super Christian. We try to be more righteous. We try to get our act together. I'm going to make some resolutions. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. And I'm going to make some promises to God. God, I promise I won't do that anymore. All of that is a man-made effort to try to assuage our impure consciences. Under the old covenant, worshipers couldn't completely clear their impure consciences. Why? Because as verse 10 says about the entire Old, system, Old Testament system of worship, they are physical regulations that deal only with food and drink and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. So these were all external physical regulations that didn't have the power to get down inside the heart of the worshiper and purify their conscience. So there's the limitations two of them in broad terms of, the, uh, of worship and life under the old covenant. And so now a massive contrast has been set up between the old and the new covenants. So let's compare them. If under the old covenant, there was restricted access to God and there was only partial cleansing from sin, in the new covenant, first of all, we have full access to God. It's no longer restricted. We have full access to God. Jesus became our high priest. We've been seeing this phrase Through Hebrews, Jesus has become our high priest. And as our high priest, he didn't just go into the physical tabernacle's most holy place once a year and sprinkle the blood of an animal sacrifice. He's our high priest, but he didn't do what the earthly high priests did. He did something different, something far superior. Far more effective, verses 11 and 12 tell us, look there. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, so he's not talking about the earthly tabernacle here, That is not of this creation. So not the physical one of the Israelites. He entered the most holy place once for all time. Not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So he entered this perfect tabernacle. What is that? That is heaven. The earthly tabernacle was just a pattern and and a symbol, a picture of the ultimate and true tabernacle, which was in heaven. He entered the ultimate holy of holies. What is that? That's the very presence of God. He entered into the very presence of God, not with the blood of animal sacrifices, but with his own blood. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He enters in with his own blood. Why? To cover our sins, to make atonement for our sins. Intentional and unintentional. And he only had to do this one time. Once for all time, it says, which means never to be repeated like the high priest would go in and repeat that sacrifice every year, year after year, because that ultimately did not clear away sins. This sacrifice does. And by doing this, it says, he obtained or secured our eternal redemption. Now, this is a staggering thought of of the power of Christ and the power and the efficacy of his death. That in his, through his death that day, 2,000 years ago, outside Jerusalem, has the power to rescue any and every repentant sinner from eternal destruction. At any hour, the, any hour of the day, think about the globe and the billions of people on earth. At any hour of the day, at any location on earth, whether on the 100th floor of a penthouse apartment in a skyscraper, or in a cardboard box shelter on the streets of Calcutta, if a repentant sinner cries out to God for mercy, by the blood of Christ, they call on Christ. They are eternally, immediately, forever saved. I mean, anyone, anywhere. How effective is that from this one sacrifice that was offered 2,000 years ago outside the, the gates 
of Jerusalem. So any person, regardless of the evil they've committed, regardless of any evil that you have committed, if you will turn away from your sin and your allegiance and love for the things that are not of God, and you turn to Christ in faith, then you'll be forever saved. I mean, that's incredible. That is an incredible gift. Immediately, the second you call on him, he will save you. He's not going to have you fill out an application. Prove yourself. No, he did everything necessary. That singular act secured eternal redemption for all who would put their trust in him. And nothing else can ever be added to what Christ has done. That's what's meant by the word once. And this is why Christians believe that no one and nothing but Christ is necessary for eternal life. And nothing else and no one else is sufficient for eternal life. Now, some of you maybe have had, I, I had some of my best friends in high school were Mormon. And so I will tell you the story with just respect for our Mormon neighbors and love for them. But when, the, when Mormons come to my door, I'm not the guy that wants to, to run away. I want to talk to them. You want to evangelize me? I'll evangelize you. I don't need to know all the answers. It's helpful if you know some things about Mormonism or other religions. But if you know the gospel, then I think there's value in just sharing that. And that's what I did. So I spent a long time with a couple of these more young Mormon missionaries. I have respect for them. They're bold. They're going out there. And they're sincere and they're earnest. But I don't think it's according to knowledge. And I said to them, after long hours of conversation, I said, can I share with you something? I said, when I read the Bible, which you say you believe, it tells me that in Christ alone, God has done absolutely all that is necessary for my eternal redemption. I went to this verse, Hebrews 9, 12. I said, it looks complete to me. So with all due respect, and I mean that with all due respect, I don't think that I need to embrace Mormon doctrine about Joseph Smith or any of the other things in order to experience salvation in its fullest sense. Nothing else is needed. There are no more requirements to add into the mix, which is what Mormonism does. Because the scripture tells us that Christ alone has done it all. And verse 12 again says that he entered the most holy place once for all time, which means he opened up the way to God for us. We've already seen this. We saw this in one of those crux, maybe uh, McGregor argued, and I would agree with him, one of the central verses, if not the central verse of the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 16, after it says Christ has passed through the heavens. Verse 16 says that the implication, therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. The way has been opened. Full access is granted. So in the new covenant, we have, first of all, full access to God. And secondly, we have complete cleansing from sin. So the very limitations that he raises about the old covenant, about restricted access to God and only partial cleansing from sin, he answers with the new covenant that we have full access to God and complete cleansing from sin. So the old covenant regulations provided for outward ceremonial cleansing. Strange stuff to our ears, like if you touch a corpse, I mean, how many touched a corpse this week? But if you happen to touch a corpse, you were ceremonially unclean, and you were prohibited from engaging in corporate worship. But there was a provision, there was a ceremonial ritual, a cleansing that you could go through in order to make you ceremonially clean. And that's what the author's talking about. You could be made ceremonially, ceremonially, outwardly clean, but not inwardly clean, dealing with your conscience. Because the old covenant practices could never purify internally your conscience from sin. Only Christ and his sacrifice could do that. That's the point of verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh. Okay, so if if those Old Testament regulations cover your ceremonial cleansing, your outward cleansing, how much more, a lesser, a lesser to greater argument, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Here it is, internal, from external to internal. Cleanse our consciences from dead works. For what reason? So that, purpose, we can serve the living God. So old covenant sacrifices didn't affect the conscience. They didn't get deep inside you. But Christ's sacrifice purifies you inwardly to the inmost being, into your conscience. That conscience that has burdened you, that has troubled you, washes it clean so that you can stand right before God, so that you can stand clean before God, so you can stop running from God, cleanses your conscience from dead works, either ceremonial works that can't save you or your sinful deeds, your sinful works. 
the blood of Christ cleanses us from all that moral condemnation that we feel in our hearts because of our sin. And the author says that that cleansing actually enables us to serve the living God. Implication? Without that cleansing, you're not able to serve God. You're not able to worship God. So it stands to reason that an impure conscience would prevent us from serving him. How so? Let's think about this, and then I'll land the plane here in just a bit. If our conscience is defiled by our sin, it'll keep us from being able to serve God because we feel dirty. We feel ashamed. We feel not right before God. And so we run. And so we keep God at arm's length. We may come to church. We may half-heartedly sing or mouth the worship lyrics as the music is happening. We might crack open the Bible every now and then. We might try to pray here and there. But we don't press in because of the condemnation that we feel for our sin. It's keeping us distant from God. And if that's the way that you go, then what we end up with is half-hearted and lukewarm Christians filling our churches. And this, my friends, is not a, a, a statement I'm saying to guilt anyone. I'm saying this is what happens, and I see it in the church, I think particularly among men, in the issue of sexual morality on screens. There's this condemnation that we feel, there's this, there's this filthiness that we feel, and so we don't press in because we're hiding. And so we end up half-hearted and we end up lukewarm because we're not standing clean. So what should you do if you're entangled in sin and your conscience is troubled? Fake it till you make it? No, that doesn't work. You rely on the blood of Christ to purify your conscience. You confess your sin. And you rely on his grace. And you are reminded that that's where your forgiveness is. That's where your full acceptance is. That's where your conscience cleansing is. Not in your moral efforts, but on Christ. We got to stop running and being half-hearted. And this is not a, hey, let's just work ourselves up in some spiritual fervor. Pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps. No, it's to look to Christ. Because I am seeing here in the text that if we are defiled in our consciences, we're not able to serve God as we ought or as we want to. And there's a solution. It's confession and repentance. It's bringing it into the light. It's not on our performance, good or bad. A clear conscience is a gift. One of the best gifts of my life, one of the things that I enjoy the most. And not, it's not that I'm sinless, because I am not. But it says I have a Savior who forgives me. Because I was running from God, and I could not explain that defilement that I felt. And in Christ, I, I'm forgiven. I can stand clean. I love to just, I, I, I enjoy preaching, but I tell the Lord, the place that I love the most, in addition to being with people when I'm not just being up in front, is when I'm alone with him, because that's who I am. And I'm just there, and he just loves me, and he just accepts me. He knows my sins. He knows my faults. But I'm clean, and I would implore you, come clean before the Lord. Confess your sins. Tell another Christian. Don't keep God at arm's distance. Christ did not die so that you would just be half-hearted lukewarm Christian. Died to have your whole heart. Died to have your whole life. Here's the superiority, if I had to go in a nutshell, of, of the new covenant. Hebrews 8, verse 12, declares the superiority when it says, for I will forgive their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. So we're free, friends, if you're in Christ. And if you're not, then get free today. Be freed. We're free from condemnation, that's Romans 8, 1. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are free from condemnation. And we are free to serve the living God. May God give us grace to do so. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you have, in your richness of mercy, done all that is necessary for us to be welcomed into your presence. God, forgive us for running from you. Forgive us for holding you at arm's length. I pray if there's anyone here, Lord, who is entangled in sin and that sin is keeping them from having a clean conscience and, and that defiled conscience is keeping them from being able to serve the living God, to worship him, then would you help them right now to receive your mercy? To just confess that and say, I want your mercy. I'm done running. I'm done hiding. 
And I want the, the, the freedom of a clean conscience. So bring that to them. Give that to them in Christ today. And help us to walk in the freedom and the joy it is to know you, Lord, to be in your presence. And thank you that one day, uh, when you come again, Jesus, and fully establish your kingdom and in the resurrection, all the sin that's inside us and all our faults and all our sins and rebellions, they'll be gone, completely saved, completely from the power and from the presence of sin one day. And we'll be in your immediate presence. Thank you for access to you right now. We long for that day when we are in your immediate presence. Give us grace to believe in you, trust you, love you, and follow you until that day we pray now in your name. Amen.